Yes, 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 who got brands talking? Brandlive.co.za You're listening to Inside Outer with Lois Moodley. Welcome to Inside Outer, the online radio show that touches base with key industry leaders. I'm your host, Lois Moodley, the communications manager at Outer, the organization undoing tax abuse. Well, today's special guest is the author of explosive, the explosive book, Apartheid Guns and Money. He is also the director of Open Secrets. That's Henny van Vuren. Well, if you don't know, the Open Secrets heads up the People's Tribunal and the tribunal which was held last week was organized by civil society organizations and they look specifically into economic crimes which violate human rights so stay tuned for the special edition less corruption more accountability stay tuned to inside outer henny thank you so much for making the time to join us hi good afternoon good afternoon to the listeners well, Henny, as I mentioned, you're the director of Open Secrets, a nonprofit uh, working uh, on private sector accountability um, for economic crimes and related to human rights violations. And you've uh, written a book, uh, co authored a book called The Devil in the Detail How the Arms Deal Changed Everything. How's th- and it was quite a successful book. How's that book changed your life? Well, I guess, uh, you know, I, I mean. <laughs> I think when we, when we write books like these, we want to change our lives less and hopefully um, we hope to inform others who are trying to, I guess, change the relations of power between people. It's, it's really about exposing the networks that are behind issues of corruption. So the book, um, The Devil in the Detail, focused, as you say, about on the arms deal of the late 1990s involving the South African government, many big corporations from Europe who were involved in a notoriously corrupt deal. And... And what the book tried to do in a very forensic way was to try and unpack and unpick the, the networks of, of, of corruption, present a lot of the evidence that had been neglected around those issues. Um, and, I, you know, I think that to, it was clear that you know, the book itself helped to inform efforts at the Sariki Commission of Inquiry into the arms deal, giving the evidence that was required there, even if the commission refused to um, consider the evidence. And, and I guess, you know, really in, in the wake of the fact that there's been a, a clear political intervention to disable the scorpions, the state's capacity to investigate corruption, we're trying to, through that book, myself and Paul Holden make the point, who was the co-author of the book, to say um, very clearly there is uh, there's bountiful evidence of economic crime and corruption in the arms deal. Uh, and um, there is over enough reason to hold many of those those actors to account. Well, we're talking, uh, I mean, state capture is quite a hot topic right now. The state capture inquiry is going on. So, you know, and we often think of state capture within the Zuma era, but this is uh, epide- oh, p- pandemic of something that's been I- kind of ingrained in our uh, government for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think we've just spoken a little bit now, Lois, about the arms deal of the late 1990s is a very good example of high-level economic crime involving international actors, South African politicians, middlemen, and the fact that there's been a cover-up to a large extent or attempts to cover up uh, the, 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 the nature and the extent of that, that, that network. But as you say, you know, I think it, it stretches far further back than that. And um, in the book, Apartheid Guns and Money, which was uh, released last year, looks even further back from the late 1970s to the early 1990s at the network of players and actors who all benefited from economic crimes during apartheid. We had very little understanding and idea of who all those actors and players were. Um, and, and I think what we've tried to do in the book, and I've tried hopefully successfully to do, is to make a very strong argument to say that if we want to tackle issues of economic crime, we mustn't always only focus on the moment. We have to understand that the state capture that we experience today is in part informed by practices that have gone far back. Um, And each time we allow the corrupt in corporations and in government and elsewhere to get away with their actions, the result of impunity is new opportunities, new layer um, for people to be involved in similar kind of malfeasance. And I guess the, the argument that we've made quite strongly and which was confirmed 
last week um, at, uh, by the People's Tribunal on Economic Crime, the finding of the judges who considered much of this evidence uh, headed by, uh, chaired rather by uh, Justice Nakia Koop, was an argument that the, they've said very powerfully the evidence speaks to precisely the, the nature of how the networks are interconnected and our failure to tackle economic crimes that took place during apartheid enabled many of the networks to continue their corruption uh, in the arms deal and ultimately provided the first part of soil for the state capture that we are all as a society grappling with today in, in contemporary South Africa. Said that, I mean, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but uh, you know, we talk about what, uh, how this, uh, how we transitioned into democ- democratic South Africa, and we talked about um, sometimes it, it it's perceived that it was quite a peaceful transition, but pe- but a lot of people f- still feel the effects of apartheid, and it was, uh, and the wounds are still there, and they didn't feel like they've got the justice that they w- were expecting from, you know, maybe the. Um, the TRC or any of those um, inquiries that happen, uh, do you think that that, um, that that period needs to be dealt with more signif- significantly, as you're alluding to, um, to, to kind of get us uh, on, a, on a better foundation going forward? Mm. I, I think I would uh, argue absolutely, and I think that South Africa wouldn't be the only country that's gone through a, a process of, uh, of transition that many years after that transition is still grappling with the past. Um, you know, f- for, for and when, I, when, when my colleagues and I had opened secrets, the research for the book about the money, we were astounded by um, the fact that there was a vast volume of material held in government archives, particularly in South Africa, that not even the state was processing to help us to understand the nature and extent of these networks, the crime that had taken place. Um, and, you know, there are many reasons for that, but very clearly, I think as, as um, citizens, we recognized our responsibility to be able to try and tell part of that story to, make, to motivate um, our state to play the, the role that it should be playing. But I think, you know, equally, um, Lois, the argument is that we do this precisely because there are so many people who have been victims of, um, of an autocratic system like the apartheid regime was and a very corrupt system on the one hand, but secondly, a network of people who profited from those crimes. And the DRC did investigate some of these issues, but when it came to the many things around economic crimes, the relation commission was quite clear that there's a huge volume of work that still needs to be done and that that should continue after the commission has concluded its work. And so you know, we don't necessarily look at the TRC, therefore, roundly as, as a failure. It's an important milestone in the process. But I think what we are trying to do is to continue and make a contribution to the continuing the, that, that, that work. And so, you know, as an organization, we've also identified banks, other actors who we believe were central to the money laundering networks um, for the apartheid regime, and we are using legal processes to hold those players to account. They have made a fortune, we believe, off the back of oppression. They've done this by aiding and abetting a, uh, a system, a system of governance that's actually been made a crime against humanity. And um, if our government fails to, uh, the state rather, fails to hold these people to account, then, you know, then I think we are usually, it's our responsibility as a society to step in and do this, not least because we owe it to the many people who have suffered as a result of this justice on the one hand and the process is making on the other. Well, I want to get a little bit personal. What is your interest in this period of history, and, and particularly in the apartheid era? What, what drew you to research this? Mm, yeah, I think it's a hard question for anyone who's been working on a book, and I think for, for me, you know, certainly, and I'm certainly, I think I can speak on behalf of my colleagues at OpenSea, but it's, it's clearly a, a sense of, an, of um, well, I think, firstly, a, a sense of injustice. There's, a, there's an understanding that there's things that happened, and we, we, um, we simply felt that they were acts that had to be held to account. But perhaps preceding that, we didn't even know who those actors were. We didn't start this process, you know, with a, uh, an envelope with uh, indicating who all the acts were. We really went out and asked the difficult question, what happened? Given that the TRC hadn't covered all of this, our work really be, you know, was a hard task of working with organizations like the South African History Archive, Lawyers for Human Rights, taking governments to court to gain access to 
more than a million pages of documents ultimately uh, in many instances um, uh, and working through those documents to try piecing this together. And you know, I think we as a as a gener- younger generation of South Africans who weren't in power in any in a position of power during that period, um, I think we have a responsibility to help to clean up the mess. And e- equally, I think that you know there are many people who, have, who are young people today who will probably continue to having to play that role in terms of the state capture that happened. But apartheid in itself, I don't think we compare to state capture. It was, uh, I think, it, 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 it you know. It's unparalleled in our, in our, in our country's history of apartheid and colonialism in terms of the devastating effect it's had. And I think that it's all of our responsibility um, of trying to undo the damage that's had on, on our country and, and its people. And we hope to some extent by trying to hold some of the elite who we believe have profited from their participation in the regime, from their links to the regime, um, we're hopefully contributing towards moving this country forward. It's precisely our ability as a nation to understand the past, to learn from the past, to hold those people who have been involved in crimes of crimes that will enable us, I think, to better understand our world today and you know, and not to be fall for victims of corruption, of economic crime, of, of the autocrats who, who attempt to strangle our democracy. Well, I mean, given what you just said and holding people to account, what effect do you think the state capture inquiry will have, if any? Very closely, as of many other civil society organizations, including your own, Arthur. And our, um, our, you know, our, I think, firstly, I think we need to be um, very careful in not seeing this as the only solution um, to all of our problems. And I, and I guess what I wanted to say immediately was um, the notion that we must make, wait for the Commission of Inquiry to complete its work before anyone is prosecuted, I think, is a false one. Um, we have state institutions who are funded. We have officials and investigators who are paid salaries within the Hawks, within the NPA, and their job is to investigate the people who are linked to issues of um, state capture and where there is sufficient in, you know, in material and information to, to proceed and prosecute those individuals. Uh, again, one of their findings last week was precisely that, that we must wait for the Zombie Commission to finalize its work. And, and I would say, Lois, there's a, there's a re- there are a few reasons for it. Firstly, if we wait long enough, the forces who are involved in state capture um, will reassemble in different ways and are uh, no doubt doing so now. And so it's critical that, that, that the state um, proceed with, with the, the possible prosecutions of, of people that are involved. And secondly, you know, I think while we give um, Judge Zondo the benefit of the doubt, there's no doubt, and the, the Commission itself has seemed to be showing independence as robust as its work. We've had a really negative experience recently, I think, with the City Commission of Inquiry into the arms deal. That's a good example of how an entire commission can run for a few years and effectively act as a cover up of a corrupt deal. I'm not suggesting that that's what's happening with the Zondo inquiry, but what I am saying is that I think we cannot rely on these commissions of inquiry on their own. We have a criminal justice system for, for, for a reason, and it, it, it has to work. And I think it has to run and work in parallel to the work of the Zondo Commission. And you know, maybe just to add, I think our role as civil society is to make sure that, that, um, that the evidence that needs to be presented before the commission is presented, that we do engage with do ensure that it does its work, um, and, and of course, ensure that the recommendations of the commission makes, if they themselves are serious, that they inform government policy. Um, that, you know, in two years' time, the officials in government who think, well, you know, now the public anger uh, at what happened has cooled or slightly, and we no longer need to hold some of these uh, groupings to account. I think our responsibility as a society is is to keep a a very careful watch on how this process unfolds and keep the pressure up to ensure that uh, those, you know, those corporations and individuals have account um, for, you know, for the terrible destruction that they've, they've also helped to wrought in the country over the last few years. You, but you and I both know that the wheels of justice turn very, very slowly. I mean, we've had cases um, sent through that are only now coming to fruition uh, a year later. 
and oh, having a court date set, you know, two years later from when you've uh, gone to the police. Um, do you think there's any merit in us having a court for corruption specifically? I think there's, there's, uh, there is, of course, the special commercial uh, crimes unit which operates within the NPA, whose responsibility is to ensure that these complex commercial cases are prosecuted. And there was a point where there was, in fact, a court that dealt, did deal with cases of the special commercial crimes court. Um, I think there's, there's good reason for us to have that in place. And I think that it's not only because the wheels of justice turn slowly, it's because we need to recognize that over the last 10 years or so, we have lost a vast amount of the capacity within the state to even prosecute complex crimes involving particularly corporate actors. Um, there have been, at best, a handful of cases where they've been able to prosecute these. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I really think that this must be, you know, of, of uh, an immediate pressing concern for the new head of the NPA that must be appointed by the president. I think she or he needs to be somebody with an independent mind. There needs to be public input into the process of the, the appointment um, in, in future. But very clearly, I think that if they're going to be serious about the issues of corruption, it's, it's not only a question of processing dockets. It's about making sure that you have the technical experts who are able to lead that prosecution process. And in tandem, the challenge to the Hawks is, do you have the expertise to properly investigate these matters? And you know, I think that's the question that we need Parliament to be asking of the head of the Hawks. They need to be reporting every couple of months to talk about how they're building that capacity. Because otherwise, we have um, a prosecuting authority that works in full, you know, the officials who are there uh, to get paid very good salaries by the state, but they effectively do very little. I think this is, this is, you know, this is where, uh, this is one of those issues that, um, that requires, uh, you know, much attention. And, uh, and without that, I think this culture of impunity involving officials, um, corporations who think they can get away with it, uh, will to manifest. Well, do you think that President Silvio Bozo's role in Marikana hampers this notion of a new dawn? Well, no, I, I do think that um, the President has worn many corporate hats, whether they are with uh, the Bitvests or the MTNs or the Londons of this world. And I think it's, see, we need to appreciate that he comes from the and there may be some benefits to that, but there are certainly some, some disadvantages. I think there's no doubt that a company like Lonman, um, uh, you know, not only, uh, cre- well, I think importantly created an environment in which the massacre at Marikana and the murder of those, prote- of those workers took place, but equally it's a company um, where there's enough evidence to show that was involved in um, a process of moving much of its profits offshore in the 2000s. Uh, you know, under the leadership of Ian and others, precisely at a time when the workers were demanding a very basic minimum wage. Now, that problem is one of many corporations in our country who bet against the future of our country and its people by not paying their taxes, by moving their cash offshore. I mean, it's very problematic when some people start saying and making arguments that we should lower corporate tax, that people shouldn't pay so much tax. I think it's our responsibility in this country for all of us to be paying our taxes because, you know, those of us who earn even a little bit of money, our responsibility is to make sure that that money is is collected by the state and well utilized in terms of taxation to benefit um, the poor in our country and, and to tackle issues of poverty and, and unemployment. And corporations who are responsible for this, um, I think, are, are really at the root cause in terms of the illicit financial flows of, of continuing to, um, to deepen and inequality. And to your question about President Ramaphosa's links to, to companies like Lonman, I, you know, I think that there's, there's another reason why we shouldn't just accept that the, the take this new dawn for granted. We must ensure that his administration holds the corporations to account to don't pay the taxes, ensures that um, corporations act in a way that in the public interest of, of, of South Africans. Um, and uh, you know, and I, and I, I really do think uh, that that's something that um, that we need to take incredibly seriously uh, if we are to ensure that that this new dawn that he so wishes for this country, um, you know, actually has has any meaning. And for that to happen, 
we need to rethink over the way in which we hold private interests to account in our country. That's all we have time for. But before you go, are there any other books or reports that we should be looking out for? Both uh, at Open Secrets, we are busy with other investigations. Follow us uh, on Twitter at Open Secrets uh, ZA or our website, opensecrets.org. We'll be publishing some of the, um, the details of new investigations we're involved in, our advocacy efforts, and of course, the litigation, which forms part of our strategy to hold. Uh, private actors to account for the abuse of, of human rights in South Africa and around the continent, and, and of course, to, to stop them profiting from those crimes. Henny, thank you so much for joining us. It's Henny van Vuren from Open Secrets. Demand good governance. Join us weekly on Inside Outer. Thanks for tuning in to this special episode of Inside Outer with best, best-selling author Henny Finn Furen. Please join us again next week as we speak to influencers who are steering South Africa towards becoming more accountable. Live from 27 boxes in the heart of Melville, this is brandlive.co.za.